But today we're here actually not to watch my screensaver, but to hopefully learn a little bit about uh, the influence that uh, Leonardo da Vinci had on Salvador Dali and providing, in a way, a model for this, uh, this surrealist artist to move on once he left surrealism. And uh, this really is pretty surprising, some of the connections. So just to do the laundry list of both artists and the kind of things that they were involved in, we all know that Leonardo da Vinci is the quintessential Renaissance man, the man who's accomplished more than uh, the most artists or scientists take on. Born in 1452, lived to 1519, so right at the turn of that century, really influencing what became the, uh, the uh, Renaissance. He was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a musician, a scientist, an engineer, a mathematician, an inventor, a writer, an um, anatomist, um, a geologist, botanist, cardiographer, etc., etc., etc. He no field was out of reach for him, but this also led to one of the quintessential unusual situations, which is that he didn't always complete his projects. As a matter of fact, he's characteristically the person who doesn't complete his projects. Salvador Dali, 1904 to 1989, was a painter, a writer, a filmmaker. And then we start to see a lot of different things, but all still within the world of art. Um, designer of ballets, architecture, clothing, book illustrations, album covers, jewelries, commercials. You know, so also threw himself into every medium available to him, but perhaps he didn't write any scientific texts that were then published in scientific journals. Had a great enthusiasm for it, but that might be one distinguishing characteristic. Um, Helen Gardner, in her Art Through the Ages, describes Leonardo as the archetype, arch, um, archetype of the Renaissance man, a man of unquenchable curiosity and feverishly inventive imag imagination. Salvador Dali was described by Picasso as an outboard motor that's always running. <laughs> I think uh, there's a very, very close similarity to the meaning behind both of those quotes, even if one's a little more glib than the other. <laughs> and we're going to look uh, very much on a surface level at 11 different types of areas where they connect. We're going to look briefly at their youth and their interest in scientific invention. We're going to look a little bit at Freud's version of Leonardo, which influences Dali so fundamentally. We're going to look at the idea of invention, optics, mathematics, briefly at architecture and anatomy, talk a little bit again about paranoid critical method, and then look at three pieces that they both share, the Leonardo, or I mean the uh, Lita and the Swan, the Last Supper, and then conclude with the Mona Lisa. So it's going to be very much a surface kind of presentation, but one that uh, will hopefully fill in some of the blanks as to how uh, Dolly looked to Leonardo for um, uh, guidance in a way, and also to develop his idea of genius. Uh, so we begin with the, some of the ideas about youth. Both of them were interested in the pre-birth stage. And here we have Dali on the right-hand side, as photographed by Philippe Halsman, in an egg, in his interuterine experience prior to birth. And we have Leonardo da Vinci as one of the most radical uh, artists who became interested in anatomy in a completely different way than it was even possible or understood at that time. He was doing things very much uh, quietly for himself to explore how birth happens, how the body really works. And here we have his uh, um, indication of an embryo inside the womb, which is very much, I think, what Dolly models his photograph on. We know that uh, da Vinci was born in the Tuscan town of Vinci in the Republic of Florence, so pretty much right in the center right here. He spent a lot of time in Milan. He moved uh, back and forth between the two. He did some work uh, down in, um, well, he did some work also in Venice and eventually winds up uh, dying in France. So he winds up going up to uh, France in the latter days of his life. Dali spends most of his time in Catalonia, very much at the tip of the French, uh, I mean, very much at the tip of the Spanish continent, right on the upper uh, northern and eastern side under the Pyrenees. And that becomes really his world through his entire um, staging of his uh, career. And both of their fathers were notaries, just a kind of sideline, but it's a sort of interesting. I don't know if that appealed to Dolly as much as everything else, but certainly he would have made note of that. Um, Dolly actually starts talking about Leonardo at the very beginning of his career. 1919, he's part of a student project where they're writing um, a, a small publication, and each, uh, each one of these publications, Dolly writes about a different artist. 
And there's about 15 to 20 different articles that Dolly writes, but one of them is about Leonardo da Vinci. And some of the words that he uses are very much from the, the perspective of a 15 year old. He says, above all, Leonardo was a passionate soul in love with life. He studied and applied everything with the same ardor and the same pleasure. In life, everything appeared to him positive and attractive. Um, da Vinci's paintings are exemplary of the reflective, constant, loving work that went into them. Now, 15-year-old probably has never seen a Leonardo da Vinci in person. This is definitely a romantic notion that Dolly is developing as a youth. And the interesting thing is, of course, that at this point he's heroizing him, and he will continue to heroize him throughout his life. The 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, which was published in 1948, right when Dolly returns to, uh, to Spain, really becomes Dolly's um, sort of love letter to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, da Vinci had a book that was published after he passed away that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, which was advice to young artists. And definitely this book is very much an homage to that. It's also a primer or advice to young artists, but it's filled with uh, a lot of nonsense a lot of things that will not help the young artists, such as to be a great artist, you need to be married to Gala. That's a bit hard, <laughs> you know. There are many passages like that. A great artist has to have an angel guiding his hand. Not a really good secret to, uh, to apply. But in this book, Dolly actually has one of these fun um, charts rating the artist, so to speak. And Leonardo da Vinci is at the top of the chart, and we have people like uh, Ong, um, Velasquez, Bouguereau, Picasso, Mondrian, a variety of different artists that Dali uh, either heroized, was influenced by, or despised. <laughs> and here we see how this works out. Vermeer is at the very top. For Dali, he just misses one point, having a perfect 20 all the way across, uh, across the way. Raphael is just under him, and then Leonardo. And I think the reason that Raphael is actually ahead of Leonardo is because he was all about beauty. Everything about Leon that Raphael that um, that Dolly saw, he would say Raphael is the perfect example of pure and complete beauty. But for Dolly being a kind of industrious um, experimenter, it seems that Leonardo was the one closer to his heart. But there are a lot of references to Raphael and Dolly's work as well. It's also worth pointing out that Mondrian um, doesn't do too well. Uh, he's, he has a six. <laughs> and it's nice. This is actually the document where Dolly originally writes this out and kind of compares it. And you can see he had some troubling problems with Mondrian, trying to figure out what he finally wanted to give him. It eventually, it elevates a little bit more from what he originally planned. But uh, it's, it's nice, too. Little things like there's a 17 in this race, and it becomes an 18 for, uh, for Leonardo. So um, it, it's a fascinating and just very simple and, in a way, kind of caustic or glib uh, take on all these different artists. But I like that Dolly places himself a little above Picasso, you know, just a little bit. <laughs> So even his hero, he sees himself surpassing. But uh, to really understand Dolly's understanding of Leonardo, you have to go to the book that influenced Dolly about Leonardo, which is Sigmund Freud's take on Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Sigmund Freud, of course, the Austrian uh, neurologist who founded psychoanalysis as a school of psychology and as a scientific um, field for studying things like dreams and slips of the tongue and coincidence, things that had infinite appeal to an artistic personality. Well, one of the books uh, that he published was published in 1910, and I believe it was translated finally in 1927, but it was uh, Leonardo da Vinci's version of, um, it was Leonardo da Vinci, a memoir of his childhood. And Freud later felt that it was the only really beautiful work that he ever created. This is the work that in a way he was most proud of. And it's almost an implication that in his mind, he was working on the science of aesthetics that he felt there was a lot that, um, that came from the world of psychoanalysis that applied directly to understanding culture. And certainly it was greeted by the cultural world, world in a variety of different ways. Most people felt, um, well, many of the art historians, of course, felt that it was just a piece of trash. <laughs> they mostly dismissed it for a variety of reasons, which we'll talk about briefly in a moment. But as far as um, Freud was concerned, this was really, in a way, the most important contribution he had made to culture. And what he essentially was doing is he realized that Leonardo da Vinci has this, is sort of the embodiment of the artist who can't finish projects. And so that becomes sort of the, the starting point. Why is that? Why is it that da Vinci has these problems of completion? And the one thing that, uh, that he kind of pulls out of uh, 
Da Vinci's background is that he has two mothers. He's first born out of wedlock, so he's a bastard child, and he's raised for, I believe, the first 12 years of his life by this woman who um, his father had met, but having no support by the father. So in a way, it was a very quiet sort of maternal environment to grow up in. There was no privileges, but there was no responsibilities either. So he was able to be constantly given to his interests without worrying about having to go to certain classes or having to prepare himself for certain exams or that type of thing. And so it became just a very open-ended, uh, um, explorational childhood. At a certain point, his father comes in, takes the son, brings him into his house, and suddenly there's a new mother who is um, overlooking and overseeing him. He doesn't see his original mother again. And he basically now has a number of brothers who are all somewhat in competition with him, have all been prepared for careers, and are somewhat looking down upon him because he's more the, the rural bumpkin. And so this becomes, in a way, the, uh, the interest that then leads to Freud's talking about uh, um, the Virgin and St. Anne, which we'll see momentarily. The other important thing is that there's one and only one dream that's recounted in Leonardo's sketchbook. And it's very important and it's very strange and it lends itself to a lot of different ways of thinking. But apparently when Leonardo was a child, he said he had one dream he particularly remembered where a large bird of prey came down and put its feathers, its tail feathers into his mouth when he was in the crib. And so of course this has a kind of oral sexual, you know, fantastic quality to it, which Freud of course captures and brings into the story. And basically Freud's take on, on Leonardo da Vinci is that because of this maternal upbringing, because of this sort of loss of the father figure, he doesn't have that ambition to need to complete projects, but he also is a, a latent homosexual who, because of the repressive conditions of his environment, sublimated his sexual power and the libidinal energy then went into his artwork. So there was this driving force that constantly made him like a machine that was constantly engaged with things, but there was none of that uh, patriarchal, um, sense of having to complete and fulfill contracts and tasks. So that's, that's the brief take on what Freud does with Leonardo da Vinci. There's one very interesting chapter that becomes the real problem for art historians. And the chapter basically says that Leonardo da Vinci um, had this dream that connects him to, um, to actually Egyptian culture and Egyptian mythology. The book that Freud was reading, the translation of Leonardo's sketchbook, actually translated the type of bird that visited him as a vulture. And so he starts saying, it's interesting how in Egyptian culture and Egyptian mythology, it was believed that there was no male vultures and that the female vulture would become impregnated while in flight. And this became known by even the early Roman Catholic Church and it became a symbol of the Immaculate Conception, the birth without father. And so, he became very fascinated by the, um, the painting, which is, of course, St. Anne and the Virgin, where there's two mothers and one child. Uh, so the Christ child is on the ground playing while he's looked at by two mothers, both of them having the same sort of smile. Um, what's really crazy and interesting is that there was a Reverend Fister who was friends with, Le with um, Freud, and he said, you know, it's really interesting that in a St. Anne there's actually an image of a, of a vulture. And Freud was curious about this. And sure enough, he was able to find a hidden image. Um, if you look here, this would be the beak of the vulture. This is the head of the vulture. This is the vulture's wing. This is the vulture's body. And then the tail, which actually goes right into uh, the young Christ child's mouth. Now, of course, please understand, this is not what Leonardo painted. This is simply, we start looking for things, and we can find shapes that lend themselves to this interpretation. Freud didn't really believe this or buy into it, but he thought, that's really interesting, and he actually included it in his book. Well, the problem is, and it's a really simple, fundamental problem, the book that Freud read, it was a mistranslation. Instead of a vulture, the bird was a kite. And there's no mythology of kites as having immaculate conceptions or any of this. So it's, <laughs> it's a completely erroneous part of the argument, and it's a big part of the argument. So this is why art historians were always very contemptuous of Freud and were able to dismiss these, uh, these ideas. The Surrealist, not so much having a problem with that, and particularly <laughs> Dali. <laughs> this actually becomes part of the, sort of the cornerstone in a way, for Dali's study of the Malays Angelus. 
the fact that erroneous and sometimes even incorrect information can lead to more remarkable um, you know, understandings or misunderstandings that become more fascinating. And for, for Dali, there's an entire side story which is about his obsession with Malay's Angelus and how he comes to conclude that this is actually a painting not about a couple giving thanks, but rather a couple that are caught in this moment of sexual anxiety where the male fears he's gonna be cannibalized by the female. And there's a very, very long Freudian case study, in a sense, that Dolly writes about all of his experiences and thoughts about and popular cultural references to this particular painting. And he writes it more or less as a primer, as you can see. It's like a, child, a children's school book that gets uh, locked up by the, um, uh, by the belt, and it has like the, the study title on it. So this would be social science or English, but instead it's the tragic myth of Malay's Angelus. So it's very much inspired by not just Freud's book on Leonardo, but Freud's inaccuracies about Leonardo da Vinci. And Dolly takes that as kind of the authorization to do the same thing himself. And this leads to a very important painting that we right now have in Paris in the Pompidou Museum as part of the um, Dolly exhibition that's there. Um, we have our portrait of, uh, of my dead brother, which is Dolly's painting from 1963 of this imaginary portrait of the absent brother in his life. And one of the things that's interesting is he often thought of himself and his brother as the two male childs of Leda, Castor and Pollux. One immortal, which I believe is Castor, Dolly himself, no, Pollux is the immortal one who Dolly identified with. And he saw his first brother, the first Salvador, as being, um, what did I just say? <laughs> Castor, yes, Castor, the one who, the imperfect version, the, immor the mortal one who had to pass away in order for Pollux to survive. And so he talks about how these cherries that are falling from the heavens, the, the bright ones represent him, the living Salvador, the dark ones represent the dead Salvador. But the reason that I also wanted to show this image, we'll come back to the Lita story momentarily, but right up here there's actually a hidden image. And Dolly is very clear when he writes about this that it's a vulture. He states in the, when this painting was on exhibit, he says that I have included the vulture, which according to Freud and Leonardo represents the mother figure. And so in his mind, this suddenly becomes the Immaculate Conception. And yet, when we look at it, this doesn't look anything like a vulture that any of us have seen. It's simply a blackbird. It's as if Dolly's deliberately getting that wrong as a kind of winking you know, reference to the fact that Freud got it wrong. So I think it's a very conscient, uh, conscious moment in Dolly's, uh, Dolly's work. Here he says, the vulture, according to the Egyptians and Freud, represents my mother's portrait. The cherries represent the molecules, the dark ones representing me, my dead brother, and the bright ones representing myself. The other thing that's, that's a little bit interesting about this too, okay, vulture, Egyptian mythology, female mother figure, immaculate conception. But he's also saying this is the mother of Castor and Pollux, which suddenly makes the vulture Leda, who's visited by the swan but was never depicted as a bird. So there's a sort of slippage that happens that goes back and forth in the way that Dolly will utilize these, uh, these images. So now we come to a very simple, straightforward connection, which is the idea of invention. This is a, a study by Leonardo da Vinci of um, water falling into uh, still water, creating this particular almost, um, uh, almost golden ratio type of, uh, of um, tumultuous turning and spinning, something that Dolly was very fascinated by. And Freud was given to trying to find different inventions to help man battle all kinds of different things. So this, for example, is skis made with, with pig bladders that you would eventually wear his shoes and walk across the water. He also came up with this, uh, this type of diving deep sea mask. So one of the first people to think about how would you be able to be underwater and breathing fine. And so you would have something that would be above the surface that would have the breathing apparatus going down to you. Pretty ingenious. And, uh, and actually, if, if any of you have been to Mosey last year, or maybe a year and a half ago when they had their Da Vinci show, there was remarkable um, inventions that he had come up with but never saw completed that somebody actually made so that you could actually see what these would have looked like if they had actually been properly uh, finished. And um, there's a lot of Dalinian ideas that, uh, that seem to come from that. This is a study of the flight of birds. So he was fascinated by bird flight. This is one of his studies of an articulated wing, thinking about how man can fly, possibly by wearing these types of wings that would be modeled on uh, bird wings. 
and he even came up with this idea of a kind of um, inverted uh, corkscrew hel helicopter, something that would allow for vertical flight by going against the wind and basically drilling into the wind. Probably not the best idea for an invention, but a fascinating you know, attempt to think about what types of things could allow us to become lighter than air. And this is uh, Ralph Steedman's version of Leonardo with the one time he actually did test one of his uh, sets of wings, where you can see he's uh, probably not going to have the best, uh, best chance of it. And indeed, he, supposedly part of the mythology is that he did actually attempt to have some flight at one point. It did work briefly, and then it didn't. And I don't know if, Dal if uh, Leonardo was the one who tested it or if it was one of his students, but uh, it is part of the mythology of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He also was well recognized and his, in a way his claim to fame was inventing um, um, instruments of war. And this for example is a, a crossbow which when you look at the figure right here you can get the sense of scale. This would be like a crossbow cannon that could destroy um, fortresses. This is a, a mean, uh, an interesting invention which looks a little bit like a rake but is actually a machine gun so that it could fire multiple times uh, simultaneously. And this is a, a study of an armored tank and a scythe, like a chariot scythe. So right up here you would have the horse in the middle with a wheel back here, and you would have a scythe that would rotate in the front and the back, which would plow down an entire field of enemies very quickly. And then here we have a rolling tank that looks a little bit like a haystack, but would provide protection while at the same time allowing the person to fight from inside. Now we shift over to Dali, and perhaps a little more benevolently, Dali was enthused from his youth with any type of um, invention or contraption. And so there was a particular teacher when he was uh, five years old named Senior Trader who collected a lot of these kind of scientific apparatus and, um, and tools and inventions that were more for delight and for enjoyment than they were for any kind of scientific inquiry. But Dolly encountered one of the stories he talks about is there was a, a petrified frog that would turn in different ways depending on the barometric pressure. That was something that Senior Trader was really pleased with. And there were um, optical devices. There were things that were like the stereoscope, like we have here on the, the left-hand side, or an optical theater, which would be backlit here, where you could see images in a very different way than you normally encounter them. And these were very popular. Lots of families had them. It wasn't something unique to Senior Trader. But Dolly was really one of the first generation of children who were raised with an enthusiasm for these kinds of inventions that then led to the cinema. So this kind of Understanding the world in transition, the world in change, and how optical images have a big part of that was something that delighted Dolly from day one. Dolly was also very proud of the fact that he was born in Figueres, Spain, on a street named after Narcisse Monturiel. And Narcisse Monturiel was a Catalan from the city where Dolly was born, who was one of the first inventors of a working submarine. And for Dolly, this was just fantastic. This was like a great um, omen for his future. <laughs> that uh, he was from the same city of these, this incredible kind of Jules Verne inventor. And of course, Dolly pays homage in 1936 when he dresses in a deep sea diving suit to give a lecture about surrealism. That just like Narcisse Monturio, he's gonna be diving to the depths of the unconscious and bringing back the treasure from the unknown. So he was very proud of that fact. He also was a great enthusiast of Scientific American, subscribed throughout his life, read it with great uh, enthusiasm and would often try to have opportunities to meet some of the scientists who wrote for the magazine. So he was uh, definitely not just passively interested, but he was really engaged from uh, day one. And this gives you a sense of what was available for Dolly as an inventor to actually create. This is something Dolly calls the avociped, and it's basically like a human hamster ball so that uh, you would stand inside of this thing, sit inside of this thing, and it has little grooves, and I guess you could wheel yourself through the world with a kind of ease and transportation that doesn't require a bicycle and allows you, I guess, to hit things and move on without being damaged. It's crazy, it's nuts, but even more so, Dolly actually has this kind of uh, NASA suit sort of made for him for the pose so that uh, you know, he's got the right suit to travel with it. Uh, there were certainly ones made, obviously. I've never seen one, and I've never heard of, uh, of it still existing. It was probably you know, one of the bygone uh, lost items of history. But, um, but there's even an advertisement, I think, in one of the magazines from that time. So um, why such a great interest in science? Dolly says it's because artists scarcely interest me at all. 
Now, that's an overstatement, of course. But he says that I believe that artists should have some notions of science in order to tread a different terrain, which is that of unity. So for him, science actually provided a way of understanding what he was doing as an artist that was contributing to a kind of bigger picture. Which leads us to optics and perspective. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, in one of his uh, studies for a bellow, actually included down here a, a study that looks very much like something from Albrecht Durer. And when we blow it up, what you see is an artist seated at this optical device looking at a three-dimensional shape, a round ball, and trying to figure out how to draw that accurately onto a surface. And somebody else has gone back and kind of redrawn it so we can see it a little bit more clearly. But we have the artist peering through a pinhole. He's really looking at the large orb behind. And somehow this must be a transparent surface that he's sketching exactly what he sees. And the idea is that this allows for great accuracy in terms of the visual optical illusion and the accuracy of the illusion recreated on a two-dimensional surface. And a lot of artists in the Renaissance dealt with this idea of the mathematics behind this and the way that we perceive reality. But this is the type of invention that Dali just really adored. And in his uh, 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, he comes up with a kind of tongue-in-cheek transformation of this idea. He basically has the artist looking through a sea urchin. And at the end of the sea urchin is a little viewing machine, a little viewing device almost like a binocular end. And he says that this allows the artist to sit in front of the finished work and appreciate it in much more um, infinite pleasure in terms of the visual phenomena. That somehow this focuses all of your energies into the optical appreciation of the conclusion of your artwork. So it's this strange sort of, not a way to understand three-dimensional reality, but rather to enhance the pleasure of being a great artist and understanding what you've accomplished. So it's pretty bizarre. Um, Dali was also aware of the obsessiveness of the Renaissance with trying to capture optical illusion and create the perfect vanishing point to create a true model of a three-dimensional space. So this is one of uh, da Vinci's early studies where you can see that he is constantly thinking about how to get those lines back there so that they all converge in one spot. This is a slightly more refined version of that, but it's the same idea. It's all about trying to place three-dimensional images properly in terms of perspective so that they align with the vanishing point. And then this is an early study by Dali of a portrait of his sister sewing. And I don't know if you can really see it in the slide, but there's a lot of lines that have been placed there, all mathematically intended to draw the eye directly past the sister into the city in the background. And the vanishing point is right about here. I can't see the lines from here, but they are there. So he was um, constantly trying to think of how you would do that. And this is a, a completed painting where you don't see the lines, but you become completely aware of the fact that this is a really tightly organized geometric space with the sister sitting at the um, balcony sewing, and yet everything draws our eye through the architecture into that background where then he has the, uh, uh, the sign over here for Ford motor cars. You know, so it's the sense of the Renaissance updated into the present, but they're very close together in these works. Shifting a little bit further to a very important connection between Dali and Leonardo da Vinci is the idea of mathematics in the golden section. And the most important thing to know about Leonardo da Vinci is that he had a great opportunity when he was in Milan to meet one of the great mathematicians of his age, which was Luca Pacioli. And Pacioli was studying ideas about the golden section, he was studying the way that platonic solids are constructed. He was fascinated by geometry. And Leonardo, being unschooled but open to all of these ideas, really became his immediate pupil and tried to, you know, really like a sponge, get as much information as possible from Luca Pacioli. Pacioli adored the fact that he had such a great artist who was enthusiastic about everything that he was working on. And this led to um, uh, a collaboration between the two of them where Leonardo da Vinci actually stepped forward and decided to do a number of illustrations for his book on geometry. And he was able to create these very um, elaborate three-dimensional models of the geometric forms that, uh, that Pacioli was talking about. So this all has to do with divine proportion. And these are the five, um, the five fundamental polyhedra, or the five um, platonic solids that come out. And I don't have the names by them. I won't try to 
mention them, but the important thing is that this was the first time ever that an artist had conceived of these abstract geometric forms in a three-dimensional um, kind of environment. And this is the, one of the pages, one of the many pages from the book where you can see these beautiful models that Leonardo was able to uh, create for the illustrations. So this is an Aram, um, a rhombocubic, uh, rhombocubic tetrahedron, or something like that. <laughs> Going back to Dali's 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, we have in the foreground two of uh, Leonardo's illustrations, and then we have three very, very free adaptations by Dali. One of them is like a monster Superman kind of creature. The other is a very inventive series of sexual positions. And the third appears to be some sort of a very ornate uh, jewelry. So Dali's just very freely looking at these things and doodling, and these doodles become the corners of the book. Now Dali parallels Leonardo da Vinci, and this is what's really fascinating. He has an opportunity to meet this gentleman. Uh, his name is Matilla Gika. He is a poet, a novelist, a mathematician, a historian, a diplomat, and he's a Romanian minister from the United Kingdom. And he comes to the United States and he's teaching at the University of San Diego. They meet at a party in 1947, and Dolly's discussing, you know, Dolly finds out he's interested in the shape of nature in relation to mathematics and the divine proportion. And this is something that Dolly had actually read about before this meeting, you know, something that he was engaged by, but in a very casual way. But the conversation starts up and suddenly, um, Gika is fascinated again by the fact that here's this great artist who understands what he's working on. And for Dali, here's a man who actually knows precisely the types of things that he's engaged in and could actually teach him the mathematics that perhaps Leonardo actually knew. So it becomes a relationship for several years. There's a book by Gika, The Geometry of Art and Life, where he talks about the divine proportion. And this becomes, in a way, Dali's Bible. Um, he goes to Gika, he has lots of conversations, he actually has Gika do certain studies that later will influence the way his paintings are, are developed, and he will copy some of the designs that Gika comes up with to use as a model for his paintings. So for example, Gika was interested in the way that the golden uh, ratio applies to proportions of living features, uh, living creatures. So here with the human face, this is one of his applications of um, the square root of phi, which has to do with uh, the perfect proportions and symmetry of the human body. And this is one that some of you, certainly docents, are familiar with. This is um, Tila Gika's rectangle of the square root of phi. It's not a golden rectangle, but it has those proportions. And when you turn it on its side, it becomes the guiding principle underlying the harmony of this painting, Nature More Vivant. So if you overlay them, this is what it looks like. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of forms in Dolly's painting that correspond exactly to the kind of guideline or the strictures that were developed in this, uh, this design about the golden section. This is another one of our paintings from later, 1960. And this is one that uh, Dolly had adapted from Gika. Um, it looks not necessarily chaotic, but there's a lot of information here, and yet it still has a sort of harmonious balance. Well, the reason is because Dolly was looking at Gika's work and this was a design that actually came from, he should have been inverted. This was Gika's design for the harmony, the golden ratio of this particular Grecian urn. <coughs> Dolly just turns it upside down and then superimposes it as the order for his own composition. So the Father, Son, Holy Ghost at the up part of the pyramid and then himself at the bottom with Gala in between. But very consciously trying to use this as a structure and a model for his painting. It's also the golden spiral, which is something that Gika talks about throughout the book, and the Fibonacci sequence. Again, perfect uh, mathematical order in natural uh, forms and proportions. And then Dali uses it more or less as a guide for his own painting, where it's not quite the same uh, spiral, but the painting is arranged by, as a spiral, the Columbus painting. And of course, the Dali mustache book, got to have a reference to the golden section. So now, very quickly, just anatomy and natural proportion. Of course, the most celebrated image of, uh, of anatomy is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, which went back to the ancients and went back to Vitruvius and the ideas of the divine proportion as applied to human form. I'm not going to go overboard with telling you all the proportions, but there's a really interesting short video, like five-minute video on Netflix, um, no, on YouTube, 
that shows how these proportions were thought of at that time and actually measures it out. So if you're interested, definitely go just try to type in Vitruvian Man and it's quite remarkable uh, what it shows. Here's how the golden section essentially applies to the human face as discovered by Leonardo da Vinci back in 1400s, late 1400s. And Leonardo da Vinci was the first person to really study corpses very closely to understand how the body developed, grew, and how it worked. And there's another video on, um, on YouTube which has to do with, uh, it's an hour-long lecture by this gentleman about Leonardo da Vinci. I think it's called The Golden World of, or The Treasure of Leonardo. And there's a part where he shows some of the actual anatomical drawings that were in science books from that time and compares them with Leonardo da Vinci's drawings, and it's just absolutely remarkable. They look like they're either Chinese or Hindu drawings, which is very, very little detail, very basic ideas about the body, just single line drawings. And then this was being done at the same time, but was unavailable to science students and uh, anatomy students. So it was uh, absolutely incredible what he was able to accomplish. This is uh, some of the way, the fruition, I suppose, of those studies so that when he painted the lady with ermine, um, there's a sense of incredible beauty to this, which is something that he knows because of the anatomy underneath. And there's sort of the serpentine pose that creates one of the most beautiful um, compositions of the human body from that time. He was also fascinated by the grotesque. So great beauty and great ugliness were something that appealed to, uh, to da Vinci. When we come to Dali, just very quickly, here's not necessarily an anatomy lesson, but certainly a way of understanding how various anatomies could be built up to create something quite different. Uh, and this is actually called the great paranoic, which I'm not sure if you're seeing the face or if you're seeing the details, but there's a face here of a man with two eyes, nose and lips, and there's his chin. But all the details are actually made up of these different figures who are caught in different poses of um, what seems to be sleepwalking, tragedy, horror, shame, all these different various emotions that are making for the particular parts of the face. And that leads us coincidentally or conveniently to paranoid criticism and the paranoid critical method. Not only Dali, but I think all of the Surrealists were fascinated by the writings of da Vinci in terms of uh, his book about, um, about painting. And in particular, there's the obsession with the idea that the great artist should be able to look at a random pattern, such as ashes at the bottom of a fireplace or peeling plaster, and should be able to use their visual capacity to imagine a scene of, say, groups of figures on horseback, figures walking through an environment, and be able to be influenced by that and transfer it to a uh, canvas. It's that idea of taking something that has nothing to do with what you're trying to finish, but having the visual capacity to transform them to recognize metamorphosis. It's just the idea of the Rorschach test or looking at clouds. It's trying to recognize one thing and something else. And of course, Dolly took this to heart. And what was interesting that Dolly did is he goes one step further. He doesn't just look at clouds or ashes or peeling plaster. He looks at drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. And so for example, this is a group of uh, figures on horseback by da Vinci probably inspired by the way that he suggests artists should be inspired by looking at some random pattern and recognizing twirling horses and figures in different, uh, different poses. Dolly actually uses this design to create, uh, to create parts of the face up here. So this is a painting in our collection. It's a woman looking down. Her lips are here. Chin is there. She has kind of this decorative um, hair. But when you look up close, the pattern of the figures back here are all these figures on horseback that come directly from Leonardo da Vinci. So you can see it's not an exact copy, but it's a very loose kind of transcription to create this woman's hair that's also coming from da Vinci's earlier work. So it's, it's definitely this idea, this recognition of something transforming into something else. Here it just happens to be a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. And there was a... A period of time with da Vinci's career that's very important, which is when he's in Milan working for the Duke Ludovico Sforza. And during this time, this is where he becomes a great inventor of, um, of military machinery. But the, the great thing that he wants to do is to create this equestrian statue. And it's a homage to, I believe, the uncle of the Duke. And it's, this is one of the early sketches for it. Da Vinci's idea was that this would be three times the size of a regular horse and it would probably include six tons of lead 
in order to be melted down and create this incredible feat of uh, Renaissance sculpture. It was going to be the largest sculpture ever created. And it was just vast, and it would be like the perfect way to not only pay tribute to the uncle, but also to show his own ambitions as a great artist. Um, it didn't happen. Uh, a lot of the, the lead that was actually going to be used for it was then sent to make a cannon because they were suddenly, Milan was in battle, and Leonardo's uh, particular sculpture made of clay, which was the model for it, the maquette, was then destroyed by the French soldiers when they took, uh, took over the city and used it as target practice. So there's no example of this surviving, but this is one of the early sketches by Leonardo. The reason I'm pointing it out is because in this particular detail from our own painting, the, um, uh, three, um, the Enchanted Beach with three fluid, Im three fluid graces, when you look up close, the features of the woman's face are actually completely and totally coming from this design by Leonardo da Vinci. So again, he's borrowing da Vinci, turning it into his own image that then becomes the features of the woman. So all we're seeing here is her lips, her nose, and the side of her face. So if you see back here, it's this feature right here. But so instead of using plaster, he uses drawings by Leonardo. Architecture, just a couple of key things. That was one of the, the ways that Leonardo excelled. He, one of his first um, projects working for his master, Verruccio, was to finish this um, particular dome by um, uh, Brunelleschi on top of one of the churches. This is another just sort of fantastic design that I don't believe was completed, but it's the type of way that he was thinking. He was always thinking mathematically and architecturally. And so this is just a small study in one of his sketchbooks. Here's another study of a central church from 1488 by Leonardo. And then we look to one of our pieces in our collection, a drawing called the Ascetic uh, is the Greatest Earthly Enigma. And here you have two sculptural des or architectural designs that look very much like they were just borrowed right out of uh, Leonardo's sketches. Dali was just constantly looking to him, borrowing and reinventing. So this is almost like he's taken the drawing by Leonardo and turned it into a piece of, um, of um, jewelry. Dali was also engaged in architecture. He designed this ever so lovely uh, um, pavilion. <laughs> This is the Birth of Venus Pavilion in the uh, streamlined uh, World's Fair of 1939. He also has a piece from 1945, um, shortly after that, where he contemplates his wife's back as if it's become architecture. So here's her body transformed into a kind of architectural edifice. And this is a really interesting and unfortunately unfinished project where he imagined one of those platonic solids that Leonardo da Vinci had de developed, designed the um, icosahedral studio, the icosahedral um, form, which is a 20-sided form, he imagined how interesting that would be to have as a studio in Port Legat. So this is a sketch for a studio that unfortunately was never created, but the 20-sided form corresponded with the idea of completion in the heavens. So Dali wanted to do this, but it just never happened. And there's the regular icosahedron. Of course, Dali's own museum has the uh, uh, geodesic dome on top of it, which in a way is the taking of that idea, the, I, I guess, the form we just saw, <laughs> and turning it into something much more elaborate and scientific to make it the crowning uh, you know, achievement of his own museum, which is where he's now buried. And there you have uh, Buckminster Fuller, who fits right into this idea of science and architecture and thinking about the future from different ways. So to conclude, let's look at three different examples of works by Leonardo da Vinci in relation to what Dali does with them. The first one is Lita and the Swan. And this is some of the studies for uh, Leonardo's Lita. And one of the things that's been pointed out is that all of the incredible tendrils of her curls and her hair are all based on um, the golden proportion and the golden ratio. So there's this incredible obsessive compulsive need for science, well, for mathematics, to control even the vision of, a, of this beauty. And it looks a little bit like Star Wars, too. It's hard to ignore that. <laughs> Maybe the initial inspiration for Star Wars. Um, this is the best known copy of Lita and the Swan. This is one of the few pieces by Leonardo da Vinci that was completed, but then over the course of time has disappeared and is probably gone forever. But this is a copy known by Cesar de Sestro from uh, 1508 shortly after the 14th, uh, 16th century. And you can see just this incredible beauty and harmony as she sort of interacts in a playful way 
with the swan, who is, of course, Zeus that's visiting her, that's about to impregnate her, and is why this actually happens on her wedding night. She, of course, has been preg impregnated by her husband. Zeus comes, adds to the mix, and suddenly she's double impregnated, and that's why she has two eggs, one containing Castor and Pollux, and the other containing Helen and Clomestra, both of them containing one mortal and one immortal figure. And you can see down here at the bottom, these are the two eggs as uh, they were presented in Leonardo's painting. So the one having the two boys, the other having the two girls. So a lot to do with Dali. He creates in 1948, when he returns to Spain, an image he calls Lita Atomica. And this corresponds not only with his time that he's spending with uh, Matilla Gica and learning about mathematics, but it's also his response to the idea that um, the atomic bomb has revealed to us the fact that all around us, we have solid objects that on a subatomic level are made of particles surrounded by space and held in perfect balance but constant motion. And so here in this painting, it's one of the first examples of what Dali calls nothing touching each other. Everything floats, everything's harmoniously arranged, but nothing is placed on top of it. It all floats in relation to the other objects. And here you can see that although she's sort of looking at the swan, the swan also appears to be behind her and there's been no point of contact. So it's still this kind of chaste, virginal interaction between Lita uh, or Lita Gala and the swan as we see in the visitation. And the thing that's interesting is that Dali adds two sketches for this piece into his 50 Secrets. And when you look at them, the longer you look at them, you start to realize these probably were never originally sketches for the piece, but they were sketches done afterwards to prove how close he was to Leonardo da Vinci. They were like the show-off pieces. You know, this is, this is what he intended. Is he wants to make sure that you don't miss out on the fact that this is Lida Gala placed inside of a sphere that also contains a pentagon, uh, a pentagram, which also has this uh, star figure as the organizational principle. So very, very tight geometry that he's employing here. And then this is another even crazier version where he's employing all of his geometric uh, ideas and showing them at the same time that he's including all these kind of whimsical sketchbook ideas down here that have nothing to do with the composition and are, again, just kind of showing off and making a very um, illustrative connection with his hero, Leonardo da Vinci. Which brings us to our next piece, which is The Last Supper. Of course, the greatest of all of Leonardo's works next to the Mona Lisa. And it's in the Santa Maria del Grazi in Milan, in this church up here. This is what it looks like now. There was actually a, a room, a door cut into it when it started to deteriorate at some point. And this is after the recent renovation, I think, which was completed in 1999. But you can see the work is still very strange and it's susceptible to lots of problems because from the very first day, Da Vinci decided that he was gonna try a new technique, which was to create a fresco on a drywall, rather than using it on a painting on a wet wall, which would then dry as the work was being done and cement the, uh, the color into the material itself, he tried to paint like he would on a canvas on a surface uh, of um, finished plaster. And of course, what happens is there was no binding, there was no biting on So very quickly within the first 20 years, the piece is already falling apart. And that's become sort of the celebrated story is that after all these years, we are still spending incredible amounts of money because we don't want this thing to go away, and yet it will constantly be rotting and deteriorating and changing before our eyes. But in its time, it was the most amazing work of art ever created. It blew people's minds. It was the first time ever that Christ and the, um, the group of uh, disciples were all presented on the same side of the table as if you were at the table with them. And the use of geometry was really the, the clincher because this would have been in a, um, in a room where the figures at the church, the, the gentlemen, um, I don't know if they were monks, but they would have actually dined. So they were dining in the presence of, you know, of Christ at the Last Supper. So it was just this remarkable understanding of how he connects with their daily lives. And it was also the first time ever that an artist had presented not a kind of stock collection of figures, but rather each figure has his own individual and unique psychological response to being told that one of you will betray me. So it's this remarkable sort of um, harmonizing of all of these different responses. And it was also the first time that uh, Judas was presented on the same side with the other disciples. He was often singled out and placed on the other side of the table. So this was another remarkable invention. 
Here you can see the golden section applied to it. This is the period of time when uh, da Vinci was working very, very closely with uh, Luca da Pacioli, and he was constantly going back and forth with trying to talk about the, uh, the mathematics of this. And here's the, uh, the application of single point perspective, where everything in the room all goes back to the right eye of Christ as he's sitting at the table looking out at us. So again, that brought you right into the composition and this illusion that you were, uh, you were there. There was also another deviation, which is that it was the first time ever Christ was presented without a halo. The idea was that there was this light coming in through the room that created the sense of aura around him and that da Vinci felt that that was enough. And here you can see a little more closely the right eye that seems a little bit more open and the window that he seated before. And this is the group that includes Peter and um, Judas and um, I believe St. John, who the Da Vinci Code is all about how that's a female figure. It's the Madonna, or no, the Magdalene uh, Mary. And anyway, we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go somewhere else, which is, of course, Dali's interpretation of the Last Supper where he employs, again, not just the idea, the concept of the Last Supper as da Vinci had, had um, originally set it out, but also da Vinci's studies for Luca Pacioli's book, so that here we place the Last Supper within the dodecahedron, so that uh, the entire thing is happening within the celestial um, um, mathematical space that creates a sense of the cosmos. And the other thing that Dolly has abandoned here is the idea of personal psychological responses everything becomes kind of a set piece of mathematical symmetry. Two disciples here, four over here, four over here, exact reflections if you cut it down the center. And this is the dodecahedron, the 12-sided um, pentangle uh, form, which of course corresponds to the 12, um, uh, 12 months of the year, the 12 um, apostles, all of these different uh, references to 12 that conveniently work. And Christ is seen as a kind of transparent, ghostly being uh, overseeing the Last Supper, and you have the breaking of the bread and the, the glass of wine in front of him, so the body and blood of Christ are presented in this composition. And there you can see just briefly some of the figures where there's also this reference to the pentagon or the pentagonal shape in the way that these, uh, their clothing falls together. So it's less about any kind of individual personality and rather about this kind of cosmic vision of the spheres. And finally, last but not least, a very brief reference to perhaps the most well-known work of any age, the Mona Lisa, the La Gioconda, the Merry One. And so many stories revolve about this, and so many books have been written about this, and she's been stolen, and she's been retrieved, and she's had rocks thrown at her. And, you know, there are, there are entire uh, shows built around, um, around her and entire careers. So just very briefly, the mystery of the La Gioconda is the, the smile, the kind of mysterious smile that seems to have been possibly provided from a variety of different ways. And the other thing that's, uh, that's very important about this, which is not really understood by a lot of people, is that up until this point, whenever you did a portrait of somebody, it was a portrait to be basically exemplify how great you were. You always had to have money to, to commission a portrait, and portraits were always done from the side view. You would always see, say, a male and a female, a husband and wife, looking at one another. You would see them from their side. You would see them in their best clothing and just garnished with all of their best jewelry. This is the first time that we see a figure in a portrait setting turning at us kind of with, from a three-corner pose who's looking at us and also not ordained by anything at all. She's wearing very casual clothing, and she doesn't have any jewelry whatsoever. There's no necklace. All of these things that have been part of the Renaissance portraiture tradition were abandoned in this composition. So one of the, the images that, I, that I've always been rather amused by is you know, that idea of how did he keep her comfortable and happy and trying to keep her from being cranky for so many studies because it took so many sittings that he would have her pose for this. One of the drawings by Ralph Steedman is that he brought in you know, jugglers and comedians and musicians and just anything he could possibly think of to keep her from just getting distracted and basically walking out on the, uh, the piece. And it's probably thought that this piece was, in his mind, never completed, never finished, that it still could have changed more if there had been more time. But Leonardo kept it with him, and it wound up being in, um, in France when he died. Here, of course, jumping into the 20th century, we have the rectified ready-made by Marcel Duchamp, where he uses a reproduction of the Mona Lisa, 
but with a very simple gesture, creates a goatee and a mustache. And he also um, writes down below, which you can't see, the letters L-H-O-O-Q, which when said in French says she has a hot ass. So the, the pun that comes about is the idea that in the 20th century, perhaps the mystery is that she's a hot lady ready to you know, have some fun later, or perhaps that she's a cross-dresser, or perhaps even that she's Leonardo da Vinci's um, animus female uh, version of himself. So there's a lot of different interpretations to it. One of the most fundamental ones is that she essentially, through Marcel Duchamp, kind of posts the end of traditional oil painting, that she's almost a marker where in the 20th century we move into post-painting and the world changes almost overnight. So this very ironic and glib sort of a summation of her skills and her talents are the marking point of why Salvador Dali and somebody like Salvador Dali as a great painter can never live in the same way that Leonardo da Vinci did in his time. It's just impossible. The world has changed so much, and through industrialization and photography and everything else, you're doing a very different project than Leonardo was doing back in his time. So I guess it's the last uh, statement or the last slide, of course. We end with Salvador Dali as the Mona Lisa. Conveniently, this is his mustache. It's not one he has to draw on. He actually is the embodiment of sort of the transitional, transgressive, male-female embodiment of, uh, of sublime beauty. <laughs> and uh, the whimsical smile is still there in some way. It looks a little more like a, a Charles Adams uh, drawing than anything else. But here we get another kind of insight into what might be the, uh, the secret behind the mysterious smile is the amount of cash that Dolly makes in contrast with his, uh, his great genius hero. And uh, I guess the last thing just to mention is that if you are interested in exploring further, there's a really wonderful article online by David Lomas just on this idea of Dolly and da Vinci and the concept of genius that da Vinci embodied for Freud, which then Dolly tried to become in his work. So with that, thank you all very much for coming this morning and hope you enjoyed it.